Hello everyone and welcome to Internet Law Review. For today's story, we have Rucho versus Common Cause consolidated with Lamont versus Benzik. These are two different cases dealing with partisan gerrymandering, one from North Carolina and one from Maryland. In one case, the parties argued that the map was biased in favor of Republicans. In another case, they argued that it was biased in favor of Democrats. The question is, is this kind of partisan gerrymandering where state legislatures choose districts based on which party will gain seats or lose seats constitutional? And if so, what remedy is there for a court? So let's get started with this decision and see what the court has to say. Voters and other plaintiffs in North Carolina and Maryland filed suits challenging their state's congressional district maps as unconstitutional partisan gerrymanders. The North Carolina plaintiffs claimed that the state's districting plan discriminated against Democrats, while the American plaintiffs claimed that their state's plan discriminated against Republicans. The plaintiffs alleged violations of the First Amendment, the Equal Protection Clause of the 14th Amendment, the Elections Clause, and Article 1, Section 2. The district courts in both cases ruled in favor of the plaintiffs, and the defense appealed directly to this court. So one of the key words in that description is the word appeal, and you'll see it right here at the top. It says the word appeal, and that fact is actually quite important in my view. Most cases come to the U.S. Supreme Court by what's called a writ of certiorari. It's a discretionary review. However, gerrymandering cases or political districting cases are different. According to U.S. law, those cases are heard by a three-judge trial court, and the appeal court is the U.S. Supreme Court. As a result, the U.S. Supreme Court does not have the option to take this kind of case. It's mandatory by law. So this is not a typical case with discretionary review, but rather mandatory review. And I think that aspect is actually really important because the U.S. Supreme Court is aware that no matter what kind of decision they rule, they're going to hear appeals like this for many years to come. And so they're worried about the political issues that come from redrawing congressional district maps. And they want to make sure that any standard they come up with is going to be such that they can't be accused of partisan decision making. So let's see how that applies in the facts presented. Held. Partisan gerrymandering claims present political questions beyond the reach of the federal courts. So a little bit about what a political question is. Courts are enabled and empowered to hear legal questions, questions of law. But there are questions of politics. And those questions are heard by the political branches, namely the legislature and the executive. They're the political institutions. They're elected politically. They make political decisions, such as what laws there should be. Or in the case of the executive, what laws should be prioritized and how in terms of execution of those laws. And so the courts make sure that they don't hear these kind of political questions. For example, the United States Congress in debating tax rates might want the tax rate to be 30 or 50%. In this situation, is there anything for the court to do? And the answer is no. The choice between one or the other is a political question, not a legal question. And so the court can't hear that kind of case. And so what the court is saying here is that this kind of thing is also a political question. And by saying that, they're saying that it's committed to the political branches, not the judicial branch. So this is not a kind of case a court can hear at all. The Supreme Court continues. In these cases, the court is asked to decide an important question of constitutional law. Before it does so, the court must find that the question presented is a case or controversy of a judicial nature. While it is the province and duty of the judicial department to say what the law is, sometimes the law is that the judiciary cannot even entertain a claim because it presents a non judiciable political question. Among the political question cases this court has identified are those lacking in judicial discoverable and manual standards for resolving them. This court's partisan gerrymandering cases have left unresolved the question whether such claims are claims of legal right, resolvable according to legal principles, or political questions that must find their resolution elsewhere. Partisan gerrymandering was known in the colonies prior to independence and the framers were familiar with it at the time of the drafting and ratification of the Constitution. They addressed the election of representatives of Congress in the Elections Clause, Article 1, Section 4, Clause 1, assigning to the state legislatures the power to prescribe the time, places, and manners of holding elections for members of Congress while giving Congress the power to make or alter any such regulations. Congress has regularly exercised its Elections Clause power, including to address partisan gerrymandering. 
But the framers did not set aside all electoral issues as questions that only Congress could resolve. In two areas, one person, one vote, and racial gerrymandering, this court has held that there is a role for the courts to play with respect to at least some issues that could arise from states' drawing of congressional districts. But the history of partisan gerrymandering is not irrelevant. Aware of the electoral districting problems, the framers chose a characteristic approach, assigning the issue to state legislatures, especially checked and balanced by the federal Congress, with no suggestion that the federal courts had a... So that seems pretty reasonable on its face. This. So that seems pretty reasonable on its face. The clause of the Constitution we just read said that states get the power in the first instance to determine time, place, and manner of elections, and Congress can overrule that by their decision. But in either case, the framers chose to give these powers to political branches of government, and therefore it is for the political branches of government to solve, not courts. Seems like a reasonable analysis. The court continues. Courts have nevertheless been called upon to resolve a variety of questions surrounding districting. The claim of population inequality among districts in Baker v. Carr, for example, could be decided on basic equality protection principles. Racial discrimination in districting also raises constitutional issues that can be addressed by federal courts. Partisan gerrymandering claims have proven to be far more difficult to adjudicate, in part because a jurisdiction may engage in constitutional political gerrymandering. So that is a key distinction here. In these other situations, one person, one vote, or in racial discrimination cases, the Congress or the states cannot engage in this type of discrimination at all. The law is clear, this is forbidden ground. And so it becomes a little bit easier to say, well, this is forbidden and not. But in this situation, the Constitution does seem to suggest that this is a political decision for political actors to make. And so they have the right to engage in some sort of political process. So some sort of political gerrymandering does seem implied by the constitutional text. So it's a question of trying to decide what's legitimate from illegitimate. Where is the line? That is the problem the Supreme Court is talking about. The Supreme Court continues. To hold that legislatures cannot take their partisan interests into account when drawing district lines would essentially countermand the framers' decision to entrusting districting to political entities. The central problem is determining when political gerrymandering has gone too far. Despite considerable efforts in Gaffney v. Cummings, Davis v. Bandermeyer, Veith, and League of United Latin American Citizens v. Perry, this court's prior cases have left unresolved where the claims of legal right may be brought in cases involving allegations of partisan gerrymandering. Two threshold questions remain, standing, which was addressed in Gill, and whether such claims are judiciable. So as the Supreme Court has indicated here, and is very true, the Supreme Court has time and time again basically said, we're looking for some kind of standard. So this is something they've been struggling with for a long time, trying to figure out if there is a constitutional basis for these cases to be decided. And they said, despite all these cases before, it hasn't yet been resolved. The court continues. Any standard for resolving partisan gerrymandering claims must be grounded in a limited and precise rationale and be clear, manageable, and politically neutral. The question is one of degree, how to provide a standard for deciding how much partisan dominance is too much. Partisan gerrymandering claims rest on an instinct that groups with certain level of political support should enjoy a commensurate level of political power and influence. Such claims invariably sound in a desire for proportional representation, but the Constitution does not require proportional representation, and the federal courts are neither equipped nor authorized to apportion political power as a matter of fairness. Fair enough. Like, what is fairness when it comes to political power? That is a real threshold question, since the matter is inherently a political one. The court continues. It's not even clear what fairness looks like in this context. It may mean achieving a greater number of competitive districts by undoing packing and cracking so that supports of disadvantaged parties have a better shot at electing their preferred candidates, but it could mean engaging in cracking and packing to ensure each party has its appropriate share of safe seats, or perhaps it should be measured by adherence to traditional districting criteria. Deciding among those different visions of fairness poses basic questions that are political, not legal. There are no legal standards discernible in the Constitution for making such judgments. And it's only after determining how to define fairness that one can even begin to answer the determinative question, 
how much is too much? Fair enough. First of all, you'd have to decide the standard, and then you'd have to decide if you violated the standard and what that means. So these are complicated questions. The court continues. The fact the court can adjudicate one person, one vote claims does not mean that partisan gerrymandering claims are judiciable. This court's one person, one vote cases recognize that each person is entitled to an equal say in the election of representatives. It hardly follows from that principle that a person is entitled to have his political party achieve representation commensurate to the share of statewide support. Vote dilution in the one party, one vote cases refers to the idea that each vote must carry equal weight. That requirement does not extend to political parties. It does not mean that each party must be influential in the proportion to the number of its supporters. The racial gerrymandering cases are also in opposite. They call for elimination of a racial classification, but a partisan gerrymandering claim cannot ask for the elimination of partisanship. None of the proposed tests for evaluating partisan gerrymandering claims meets the need for a limited and precise standard that is judicially discernible and manageable. The Common Cause District Court concluded all but one of the districts in North Carolina's 2016 plan violated the Equal Protection Clause by intentionally diluting the voting strength of Democrats. It then applied a three-part test examining intent, effects, and causation. The district court's predominant intent prong is borrowed from the test used in racial gerrymandering cases. However, unlike race-based decision-making, which is inherently suspect, districting for some level of partisan advantage is not unconstitutional. Determining that lines were drawn on the basis of partisanship does not indicate the district was constitutionally impermissible. The Common Cause District Court also required the plaintiffs to show that vote delusion is likely to persist to such a degree that elected representatives will feel free to ignore the concerns of their supporters of the minority party. Experience proves that accurately predicting electoral outcomes is not simple, and asking judges to predict how a particular district map will perform in future elections risks basing constitutional holdings on unstable grounds outside judicial expertise. The district court's third prong, which gave the defendants an opportunity to show that discriminatory effects were due to legitimate redistricting objective, just restates the question asked at the predominatory intent prong. The district courts also found that partisan gerrymandering claims judiciable under First Amendment coalescing under a basic three-part test, proof of intent to burden individuals based on voting history or political affiliation, an actual burden on political speech or association rights, and a causal link between invalidious intent and actual burden. But their analysis offers no clear and manageable way of distinguishing permissible from impermissible party motivation. Using the state's own districting criteria as a baseline from which to measure how extreme partisan gerrymandering is would be indeterminate and arbitrary. Doing so would still leave open the question of how much political motivation and effect is too much. And fair enough, because the state could obviously adopt different districting criteria. If the state can pick a politically gerrymandered map, they can obviously pick criteria that would satisfy that map. So if you're going to say, let's go with the state's districting criteria, you just run back into the same problem you're trying to solve. The North Carolina District Court further held that the 2016 plan violated Article 1, Section 2, and the Elections Clause, Article 1, Section 4, Clause 1. But the Veith plurality concluded, without objection from any other justice, that neither Section 2 nor 4 provided a judicially enforceable limit on the political considerations that the state and Congress may take into account when districting. Any assertion that partisan gerrymandering violates the core of the right of voters to choose their own representatives is an objection more likely grounded in the Guarantee Clause of Article 4, Section 4, which guarantees to every state in the Union a Republican form of government. This court has several times concluded the Guarantee Clause does not provide the basis for a judiciable claim. So this clause of the Constitution requires the United States government to guarantee to the states a Republican form of government. And the problem there is exactly what does a Republican form of government mean in most situations. It presumably would require some kind of legislature, some kind of executive, some kind of judicial branch, and some kind of balance of powers. But beyond that, there isn't much to say what makes a Republican form of government from a non-Republican form of government. So, so far, it's been non-judiciable for the same reason. How do you measure what a Republican form of government is exactly? The court concludes, the conclusion that partisan gerrymandering claims are not judiciable neither condones excessive partisan gerrymandering nor condemns complaints about districting to echo into a void. Numerous states are actively addressing the issue through state constitutional amendments and legislation placing powers to draw electoral districts into the hand of independent commissions, mandating particular districting criteria for the mapmakers, 
or prohibiting drawing district lines for partisan advantage. The framers also gave Congress the power to do something about partisan gerrymandering in the Elections Clause. That avenue for reform established by the framers, used by Congress in the past, remains open. Vacated and remanded, which means that these cases are struck down as never happening, in this case by Roberts, writing on behalf of the conservative justices, and Kagan, writing on behalf of the dissent and the liberal justices. Now I'd like to read a little bit from Kagan's dissent because it helps to highlight the nature of the problem the court was faced with. On to the second step of the analysis, where the plaintiffs must prove that the districting plan substantially dilutes their votes. The majority fails to discuss most of the evidence the district courts relied on to find the plaintiffs had done so. But that evidence, particularly from North Carolina, is the key to understanding both the problem these cases present and the solution to it they offer. The evidence reveals just how bad the two gerrymanders were, in case you had any doubts. And it shows how the same technologies and data that today facilitate extreme partisan gerrymanders also enable courts to discover them by exposing just how much they dilute votes. Consider the sort of evidence used in North Carolina first. There, the plaintiffs demonstrated the districting plan's effects mostly by relying on what might be called the extreme outlier approach. Here's a spoiler, the state's plan was one. The approach, which has also recently been used in Michigan and Ohio litigation, begins by using advanced computing technology to randomly generate a large collection of districting plans that incorporate the state's physical and political geography and meet its declared districting criteria except for partisanship gain. For each of those maps, the method then uses actual precinct level votes from past elections to determine a partisan outcome. That is, the number of Democratic and Republican seats the map produces. Suppose we now have a thousand maps each with a partisan outcome attached to it. We can line up those maps on a continuum, the most favorable to Republicans on one end, the most favorable to Democrats on the other. We can then find the median outcome, that is, the outcome smack dab in the center, in a world with no partisan manipulation. And we can see where the state's actual plan falls on the spectrum, at or near the median, or way out on one of the tails. The further out on the tail, the more extreme the partisan distortion, and the more significant the vote dilution. Using that approach, the North Carolina plaintiffs offered a boatload of alternative districting plans, all showing the state's map was an out, 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 outlier. One expert produced 3,000 maps adhering to the way described above in the districting criteria that North Carolina Redistricting Committee had used other than partisan advantage. To calculate the partisan outcome of those maps, the expert also used the same election data, a composite of seven elections that another expert had employed, when devising the North Carolina plan in the first instance. The results were, shall we say, striking. Every single one of the 3,000 maps would have produced at least one more Democratic House member than the state's actual map, and 77% would have elected three or four more. A second expert obtained essentially the same results with maps conforming to more generic districting criteria. Over 99% of that expert's 24,518 simulations would have led to the election of at least one more Democrat, and over 70% would have resulted in two or more. Based on those and other findings, the district court determined that North Carolina's plan substantially dilutes the plaintiff's votes. Because the Maryland gerrymander case involved just one district, the evidence in that case was far simpler, but no less powerful. You've heard some of these numbers before. The 2010 census required only a minimal change in the 6th district's population, the subtraction of about 10,000 residents from more than 700,000 in order to balance out equal numbers per district. But instead of making a correspondingly minimal adjustment, Democratic officials reconfigured the entire district. They moved 360,000 residents out and another 350,000 in while splitting some counties for the first time in almost two centuries. The upshot was a district with 66,000 fewer Republican voters and 24,000 more Democratic ones. In the old 6th, 47% of the voters were Republicans and only 36 Democrats. But in the new 6th, 44% of the registered votes were Democratic and only 33% Republicans. That reversal of the district's partisan composition translated into four consecutive Democratic victories, including a wave election year for Republicans. In what was once a party stronghold, Republicans now have little to no chance to elect their preferred candidate. The district court thus found that the gerrymandered Maryland map substantially dilutes Republican votes. I understand the outcome in this decision, and I think if I were a judge, I might actually have to decide along with the majority, but I would not be happy about it in this particular situation. These kinds of numbers referred to by the dissent are truly troubling and should give us pause, 
but judges cannot always reach the decisions they want to reach. And so were I to be a judge, I might have to reach a decision I don't like. And that is exactly the same thing that the majority is talking about. Either I have to use that three-pronged standard they referred to, which is a standard well understood in law for general matters, but this is a more specific matter dealing with partisan gerrymandering, which is authorized at least to some degree. And so the question of when do you cross the line, if you adopt this three-part test, it becomes vague and unclear. You're able to reach the kind of result you want to reach, so it doesn't become as helpful as one might initially make it appear. And if you pick something more objective, say numbers of deviation from the mean, the problem is there's no legal basis to really pick a number. If you say one deviation or two deviations or three deviations is authorized under law, the question is on what basis are you rendering that call? What basis are you picking that number? It would have to be an arbitrary number. You're simply picking out thin air. And conservative justices don't like to do this. They like to look to something that's in law, something that gives you some security. So even if you say there's equal protection under the law, you have to conclude from the constitutional text that since the political branches were given authority to do this, politics was initially thought of as proper. So even if you conclude that extreme gerrymandering is unconstitutional, the question for you as a judge is, what number do you pick as drawing the line? And there's no answer to that question. So you have a subjective three-part test that gives you any answer you want, or you have an objective, say, standard of deviation test. But the problem is the objective number you pick, you pick out of thin air. There's no basis for it at law. So despite my very strong personal misgivings, because I think that this is a real problem, and I really wish the court would have done something about it, I can understand the rationale of the court. And of course, I can also understand the disappointment of the minority. When you look at these maps, when you look at these numbers, when you say this map is more extreme than 3,000 randomly generated maps, you understand there's a problem, and there probably should be a solution. But is there a legal solution to be had, and not without a clear text from Congress, and they're unlikely to pass one because they're political too. But the question is, what should the judiciary, and more importantly, what should the Supreme Court do about it? Since they are a group that has to hear all these cases on appeal, remember that's the key word here, whatever they decide has to be so clear that no one can accuse them of partisanship. Every time they strike down a map for political reasons, they're going to be accused of favoring one party or the other party. And that's the nightmare the Supreme Court is really, really concerned about. They don't want to be accused of partisanship. They don't want to have to overturn a map that favors Republican or favors Democrats because both sides are going to cry foul. And it's going to make the court look even more partisan than it is, particularly as the membership of the court flips over time. So when the Democrats take over and they appoint more Democrat judges, all those decisions are going to suddenly change to favor the Democrats. And suddenly the court has become a much, much more political branch. So I totally understand this in terms of saving the Supreme Court from itself. Because even if they should solve this problem, the problem is the future. What do we do when the political membership of the court changes? How do we make sure that this is not a political determination and doesn't come out merely the way we want to? How do we make sure we're making legal, not political decisions? And there doesn't seem to be any clear way to do it, very sadly. But for now, my friends, this is all. I hope this has been helpful. Until later, friends, cheers and goodbye.